The last class concluded on the modifications that occur in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, the interior of the endoplasmic reticulum. I talked in specific terms about items one through uh, four here. To begin today, I want to expand on item five uh, because of the bit more to be said about protein glycosylation. There are two main categories of um, glycosyl modifications um, that I'd like you to be aware of. Uh, first, I want to point out these are oligosaccharide uh, modifications onto amino acids, meaning a moderate uh, collection of sugars connected to one another covalently uh, in different architectures, depending on the type of modification and the extent to which that modification occurs as a protein transits through the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi. The two categories are called O-linked and N-linked. The O and the N refers to the side chain, the exact functional group on the side chain that gets elaborated with these sugar modifications. O-linked glycosylation occurs on an oxygen. That's where the O comes from. And that oxygen can be on serines or threonines. Recall those are also the hydroxyls that will get phosphorylated uh, in different uh, kinase catalyzed uh, reaction. Um, or other modified amino acids. This here is uh, hydroxylysine, which has a hydroxyl group on it, and it's also getting elaborated with an O-linked oligosaccharide. The O-link link linkages, by virtue of the enzymes that catalyze the glycosylation reactions, are not very long. A couple of examples right here. So they can have some branches associated with them, um, uh, but they're also, but they're generally relatively short. This stands in contrast to N-linked glycosylations, um, the N being the nitrogen upon which those sugar uh, residues are elaborated. And these can be much longer and more branched. And what the branching means, I'm not going to ask you to remember all of these different shorthand abbreviations, but what these alpha, beta, 2, 3, 1, 4 refer to is the ways in which these different sugar residues are connected together. Which oxygens are they connecting off of which carbon? What are the branch points? And so forth. The other thing uh, to be aware of is, is that the character of the sugar residues changes as these branches elaborate. So you can have things like N-acetylgalactosamine or GALNAC or N-acetylglucosamine or GLICNAC, -gl mannose, so sialic acid, glucose, galactose. These are all enzyme-catalyzed reactions that occur at uh, uh, stereotyped stages along a secreted or transmembrane protein's path from the ER and through the Golgi. That path and that ordering is schematized in this cartoon. To orient you, we were talking about the endoplasmic reticulum from before. That's on the top of this cartoon. There is some protein glycosylation that starts in the lumen of the ER, uh, the, again, the lumen interior of a tube, which is um, the endoplasmic reticulum and also the Golgi apparatus. Those original glycosylation events that occur in the endoplasmic reticulum act as seeds, if you will, that nucleate uh, more elaborate elongation and branching of the sugar chains in the Golgi apparatus. I already mentioned that this occurs by a series of different enzymes, which I'm not going to torture you with, but there are many. It's very complicated. And some examples of the complexity is, first, that you have some additions of sugar residues and then removals of others. So you have elaboration, pruning, and then secondary elaborations um, of the chain. And um, the stages at, each, at which point each of these elaborations or pruning steps occurs depends upon which part of the Golgi apparatus that that protein is in. The Golgi, the last structural biology paper that I saw in the Golgi apparatus is that the best analogy is one of those um, spiral parking garages. You know, you go downtown to something, you're looking to park, and it kind of spirals your way through. If you look at it from the side, it'll look like each one of those layers, but they're contiguous with one another. That stack of parking layers are the stacks of the Golgi here. Cis being close to the endoplasmic reticulum, trans further out to the network that eventually becomes 
secretory vesicles and things targeted for plasma membrane, um, as well as lysosomes, which we'll talk more about in just a moment. One of the reasons, I think this may have come up, I don't recall exactly which lecture it, did, it came up, but um, oh, with, the, um, with lectins and the targeting of sugar residues on the plasma membrane surface, I think we had that for lysine and toxin, um, those sugars are added on in the Golgi apparatus and in the ER, and then by additional trafficking of those transmembrane receptors, all of the sugar modifications are occurring on the extracellular side, the lumen of each one of these organelles, and then when they're trafficked to the plasma membrane, out on the plasma membrane surface. What this creates is a sugar coating all around on the outside of the cell that collectively is referred to as the glycocalyx. And so it's the glycocalyx that's targeted by lectins, lectin-mediated toxins, like you heard about earlier. And then the one additional thing that I want to say on the co complexity of protein glycosylation is that even though we can categorize them as O-linked or N-linked, branched, long chain, short chain, the extent of glycosylation on any individual protein is not precise. So there'll be a range of glycosylation residues that occur um, with varying extents depending on each protein that traffics through the ER and the Golgi. And I'll give an example of this. So at this point, sometimes people are like, we don't care about glycosylation. This mattered profoundly on a paper that we published uh, last year when we were trying to study a secreted protein called GDF11. It's a diffusible uh, protein uh, uh, growth regulator, differentiation uh, regulator. And it has uh, one end-linked glycosylation site on it near its, uh, near its end, end terminus. And so we were trying to get antibodies. This is protein biochemistry from a couple of quarters ago, trying to figure out if we had an antibody that could detect GDF11 in cell extracts. So all the stuff that you saw in, uh, uh, earlier in the, in the semester, but this is what real blots look like more and often. It's not one clean band. It's a smear of different things. There's off-target bands, and we weren't sure exactly what we were looking at. The predicted molecular weight of GDF11 is um, about 42 uh, kilodaltons, and we weren't seeing any real bands clearly and f at 42 kilodaltons. We also had two different antibodies that gave somewhat different banding patterns, and so it was very hard to discern which of these was actually the target that we were looking at. But since we knew that it had an n linked glycosylation site, and we knew that the n link glycosylation, it's going to add weight to the protein. It's going to retard the extra electrophoretic mobility of that protein on the gel and also smear out that protein because each one of the GDF11 molecules is going to be glycosylated to a different extent. We wondered if we stripped away those sugar, mo sugar modifications, could that help clarify what was going on with these different antibodies? We did that with a series of enzymes that take away sugar residues, D-glycosidases, incubate our cell extracts with the D-glycosidases, and then what we found is that each one of these antibodies goes from a smear at a higher molecular, or excuse me, the, the antibody on the left goes from a smear at a higher molecular weight to a nice, well-resolved band that's at the predicted molecular weight of GDF11, a little bit over, over 37 kilodaltons. What was interesting was that this antibody didn't appear to recognize the glycosylated form of GDF11 at all. We only saw the band appear after we took away the sugar residue. The way that we interpreted this in the paper was that all of those sugar modifications were obscuring the epitope that that antibody had access to. You take them away with the D-glycosidases, and now all of a sudden you can have an antibody that recognizes it. Another example of glycosylation that brings some things close to home blood types, A, B, O, A, B. These are uh, reflections of a certain uh, type of glycosylation reaction that can occur on glycolipids, but also can occur on glycoproteins. This is a story of one gene with three different variants. This is the starting um, sugar modification. You see the um, glycnax and glucose, galactose starting. If you have the O antigen, this uh, gene, you have a frame shift mutation in this gene, and you don't do anything with this O antigen. So your, your 
protein and lipid glycosylation stops here. But if you have the A allele, you code for an enzyme. And specifically, what you code for is a GALMAC transferase that adds an additional N-acetylgalactosamine to the O antigen, shown here on the left. That creates the A antigen, and that creates the A blood type. Reciprocally, if you have the B allele, this, instead of making a GALNAC transferase, encodes for a galactose transferase, or a GAL transferase. Different sugar modification here, different antigen. That's the B antigen. And if you're type AB, you got one copy for mom and one copy for dad, and that's the blood type. I'm going to see if I preempt your question because it comes up every year. The RH factor, the other thing that's important for, for blood type, doesn't have anything to do with sugar modifications. It's a chloride transporter. It has a bunch of polymorphisms uh, on it. Um, but the A, B, and O intimately depends upon sugar modifications. Uh, yes, good question. So yours, uh, your question relates to these enzymes, the sugar modifications, and the universal donors, universal acceptors, and things like that. It does not have to relate. It does not relate to the enzymes themselves. It directly relates to the sugar modifications that create epitopes for antibody-mediated responses. If you have AB blood, you're tolerized to this modification and this modification itself. This is a precursor to those two um, antigens, and so you can tolerate to, to, to all of them. O blood type has only seen this, and then these become the um, reactive epitopes that you get an immune response to. Oh, yes, yeah. so your question is, is there a possibility of tolerizing to, to, blood, to blood type. The so I was just reading up on this uh, because of people doing this for even with existing things like peanut allergy and, and things. It does allow you to build up a certain degree of tolerance. Like you can eat one peanut if you're an adult. And things like, so you won't die by anaphylaxis by getting an accidental exposure. Um, it, it's still not so much tolerance that you won't. Um, uh, it, it's not dangerous for you to, to eat peanuts. And so if you think about this in your blood, and you think about this not just a single antigen, it's a modification that can occur all the way throughout all glycoproteins, glycolipids in the, the body. I don't think you have the window for tolerance um, that you would for something that's ingested periodically and could be titratable. Yes? a good question. So why, why might it be this way? Um, one example, or one thing, I'm not aware of any functional role of these antigens in, in one way or another. Perhaps because there isn't an intimate functional role of these, that gives a broader range of diversity for things to happen. In other words, you can have three different alleles, and it's because it doesn't critically c control um, uh, some sort of function that would be del deleterious evolutionarily. And so, unfortunately, I can't give you a much better answer than that. Like, why would you only have three? Why, w why might it not be just a hypervariable, rapidly evolving gene you know, that has uh, five, six, or seven different uh, types associated with it? I, I should also say, even though we have these different alleles, there's going to be other population level diversity. So it is polymorphic. It just doesn't change the specificity of the enzyme reaction the way that these the way that these do I have one more thing to tell you about sugar modifications and it relates to um, the protein trafficking of the hydrolases that need to end up in the lumen of the lysosomes the targeting of lysosomal enzymes occurs by a very unique uh, mechanism um, that has a couple interesting characteristics on it that draw upon some things that we talked about before. So lysosomal hydrolases have their own um, signal 
uh, that is attached to them. But it is not a linear protein sequence like what we talked about with the signal sequence for co-translational input. Instead, it gets a post-translational modification with a sugar called mannose-6-phosphate. And the mannose-6-phosphate modification on lysosomal hydrolases occurs by a two-step enzymatic process. There's not one enzyme, there's two that go in and catalyze uh, the reaction. And that recognition by the enzyme occurs on what's called a signal patch rather than a signal sequence. Signal patch refers to a 3D, um, ter or excuse, 3D, tertiary structure on the lysosomal hydrolases that gets recognized by the enzyme and then creates the site for the mannose-6-phosphate modification. So it's a structural characteristic of lysosomal hydrolases that enables this targeting. Once a lysosomal hydrolase has been modified by mannose-6-phosphate, then there's actually some parallels with SRP, SRP receptor. There's a mannose-6 receptor in the lumen of the or, uh, receptor transmembrane of the ER and the Golgi, and it's by target, it's by binding of that mannose-6 phosphate to the mannose-6 receptor that trafficking vesicles that leave the, the Golgi are targeted to lysosomes. So these will fuse with lysosomes and then all of the constituents in those vesicles um, go into the lysosome. This targeting is occurred by another form of coded pit, not a clathrin coded pit, but a codomer coded pit. And codomers generally are involved in anterograde and retrograde transport within the cell. We think of clathrin as the means to bring membrane and bring vesicles into the cell. Codomers move vesicles inside the cell back and, back and forth. Granon protein glycosylation, where it plays a role in trafficking or the characteristics of proteins. We're going to move on to post-translational import. To remind, these are uh, targeting sequences that are engaged after a protein has been fully translated in the cytoplasm. So first we'll talk about nuclear localization sequences and a variant of them called nuclear export sequences. And then simply say that mitochondrial targeting sequences have a similar theme. There are different proteins that do the trafficking in, in back and forth, but it is a uh, linear sequence, a primary sequence that gets recognized by binding proteins and moved to the organelle. Import and export into the nucleus or out of the nucleus is a very dynamic and rich uh, process and it involves a, a handful of proteins that like to be uh, aware of and get the general gist about the way in which the trafficking occurs. To remind, the nuclear pore, um, it acts as a barrier, a, a permissive barrier for proteins up, up, uh, above about 40 kilodaltons in molecular weight. It's a big hole, I'll show you an image of it in the slide in a, in a few moments, um, but there are brushes on the inside that create a barrier for larger proteins from just shuttling into the nucleus. If they're translated in the cytoplasm, you immediately have a concentration gradient that would want to drive those into the nucleus, except they have these nuclear pores acting as regulated barriers. What overcomes the barrier if you have a protein that contains a nuclear localization sequence in its primary amino acid sequence are this family of proteins broadly called caryophyrins, but specifically here are called importins, that recognize the NLS on cargo, so-called cargo protein that has been translated in the cytoplasm, and then navigates um, the NLS containing cargo along with the important through the nuclear pore complex and into the nucleus. So if there are importins in the cytoplasm and then they go into the nucleus one time, they're, they're done unless there's something to bring them back out because they're also large. They're too large to just be able to diffuse back out. And so what brings the important back out is a protein called RAN, which is a uh, GTP binding protein in the category of RAS, it's a small GTP uh, binding protein that has a concentration gradient that is uh, 
higher in the nucleus and lower in the cytoplasm. So they're dedicated, it loads up with GTP in the nucleus, and now you have a concentration gradient of RAN going from the nucleus into the cytoplasm, and RAN will also bind important. So after the cargo has released in the cytoplasm, RAN binds to important, and it will use itself as the driving gradient to go out of the nucleus and back into the cytoplasm. Out there, these dissociate by GTP hydrolysis, and then the cycle starts again. So the NLS containing cargo wants to go from here into here, and then the RAN gradient wants to go from the nucleus out. And it's these two competing gradients that um, are exploited thermodynamically to enable the regulated trafficking. The same RAN gradient is used to um, force proteins out of the nucleus where otherwise they might want to go. Let's say you had a really small protein that ordinarily could diffuse right in through the nuclear pore, except the, um, it's desirable for that protein to be excluded from the nucleus and reside only in the cytoplasm. One way that this could be done is by encoding in that protein sequence a so-called NES, or nuclear export sequence, that binds another caryophthalin. These are proteins that are involved in nucleocytoplasmic shuttling through the nuclear pore called an exportin. Here you do everything but in reverse. This time the exportin binds to the NES cargo and then rides with the RAN gradient from the nucleus into the cytosol. GTP hydrolysis, unbinding of the whole thing. And now you have a driving force for the exportin to go back in um, to the nucleus to start the cycle again. These are cartoons. This is an um, EM reconstruction of the nuclear pore. There have since been much higher resolution uh, structures reported to date. It is a massive biomolecular assembly. That's 50 million molecular weight. And where all that weight comes from are these distinct categories of proteins called nucleoporins, or NUPs, that um, assemble around in different types of symmetry around the nuclear pore. It's a self-assembly process to form the final macromolecular structure. There are different rings. These FG nucleoporins are the ones that have that brush-like character that I talked about before that serve the gatekeeper function, linkers, and other uh, char characteristics. Overall, about 500 individual protein molecules, you can see repeated with different degrees of symmetry around the nuclear pore. So all of this is what's being, um, is interacting with selectively, permissively, with those caryophthalins, importins, exportins, uh, during nucleocytoplasmic transport. So importins, exportins, we move NLS. Yeah, question? What do you mean by they or the nuclear pores? Yeah, so are the nuclear pores all the same size? They are all the same size. Yeah, so every single one of the nuclear pores has a stereotypic configuration like shown here. That's how you can determine it crystallographically and um, things along those lines. However, the degree of symmetry, so the number of things, depends on the organism. So yeast have a different symmetry than mammals are, are all the same. But I know it, it's not so deeply evolutionarily conserved that you see the exact same thing in all eukaryotes. So there are different solutions, if you will, to the nuclear pore problem. Um, how does a RAN like get back into the nucleus? How do the RANs get yeah. back into yeah. the, the nucleus? Uh, yeah, so the one thing that I, I neglected to mention, so I'm glad you asked, RAN is tiny. Okay. Yeah, so RAN, so the, the RAN itself is a very low molecular weight protein. If there's a constant, if there's a gradient of it, it, it will just go down the go down the concentration gradient. So the, the, the nucleocytoplasmic machinery, in many ways, is playing tricks with things that are too big to go in without regulation and things that are small enough to just diffuse. All right, I'm going to talk about one last, oh, yeah. Oh, if you didn't have the nucleoporins, what would, what would happen? Um, Okay. One thing I can tell you is that it's very hard to disrupt them. 
uh, because they are very long-lived protein species. I think there was, might have been a question about protein half-life or turnover a class or two ago. These last for a long time. Um, and so it's difficult to assess what their, their uh, function is. You could say, all right, well, that's insufficient. You could just knock it out. You could do CRISPR or you know, homologous recombination or any of these other things, just knock out one of them. The problem is that there's also redundancy. I've talked about all of those assemblies that are, that are in there. I know that many of them are dispensable. So you can take out many of those subunits, and then you'll still get a nuclear pore. There are examples of other nucleoporins that may exist in some. There was a question about like the diameter and the geometries. The diameter and the geometry is all the same, but there can be situations where you can have some nuclear pores containing some constituents and other ones containing other constituents beyond what was, was shown here. And I don't know the, I don't know the answer to completely ablating them. But I guess the suspicion is if you were to do that, it would be lethal because you can't you wouldn't be able to traffic anything into the into the nucleus. Um, which would be important for things like gene expression. Yeah, they provide the access. The, the, the nuclear envelope is contiguous with the endoplasmic, rough endoplasmic reticulum. But if, there are, if it were completely fused, then you, you have it walled off from the rest of the, in, the, rest of the environment. And so, yeah, so I think it, if they were totally disrupted, not compatible with eukaryotic regulation. Oh, I understand now the origin of your question. You know, how do these proteins and these nuclear pores relate to the pore? They form the pore. So it's a barrel. It's a barrel self-assembly with that symmetry. And then the membrane, the nuclear envelope, uh, bends around it. The gray here is the nuclear envelope. So you can think of them almost um, yeah, punch a hole, kind of punch a hole in that membrane and hold the membrane from fusing. If you take them away, then the membrane just fuse up again, and then you have no access. Yep. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, from here, going outside to inside. Yeah, that's the one I, as I was describing that, I was trying to think if that was true or not. The exportins, it, it's not, it's bigger, but the exportin is in the same category as the importins, um, meaning that it can, it's not, doesn't have the size limitation because it's in this category of what are called caryophorins that can go through the nuclear pore on their own. Importin is also bigger, but they combine to something else and bring it, bring it through. RAN is not a caryophorin. It's a GTP binding uh, protein, so it would, not go through if it were not small. The one final category of modifications that are important for tar targeting, and that will get us back to Noonan syndrome from the beginning uh, today, are a set of post-translational modifications that move proteins, tether proteins to membranes akin to many of the other categories of modifications that are multiple different kinds. The first one is a class of hydrophobic modifica uh, modifications called prenylation. Prenyl modification is this group right here. So carbon, double bond, carbon, carbon. And pren prenyl groups are added onto a particular amino acid consensus on the C terminus of proteins. And that motif is called a CAX box. And the CAX box stands for cysteine. Oh, you'll see where the cysteine comes in. Alanine, alanine, and any amino acid. So if you have a CAX box on the C-terminus of a protein, this will um, render it a substrate for prenylation. There are three different kinds of prenylation, and it's just simply a matter of how many prenyl groups that go on. So gerinylation is two of them. Farnesylation is three. And then if you put four, it's gerinyl, gerinylation. And we'll talk about how the, these modifications occur in the cytoplasm. You put a hydrophobic tag onto the C-terminus of a protein, and that's going to wedge into the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane.
there's a reciprocal modification that also happens on the C terminus of proteins, but this happens in the trafficking vesicles subject for secretion and anchor proteins covalently on the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. And that modification is a glycophosphatidyl inositol anchor. The phosphatidyl, uh, the phosphatidyl group is the hydrophobic group. Covalent modification of the C terminus of proteins. And now, once it, that secretory vesicle exocytosis infuses with the plasma membrane, the contents get released, but this is anchored to the, uh, that phosphatidyl inositol group, and so it will be out on the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. And the last hydrophobic modification is called meristillation. And meristillation, a similar theme, but the details differ. It's another inner leaflet modification, so modifications that occur in the cytoplasm, but these occur on the N terminus of protein rather than the C terminus. And here's the uh, meristic acid group that gets conjugated to the N terminus. Different targeting sequence as well. Here it's methionine. Remember, protein translation starts with methionine, followed by glycine. And to begin circling back to Noonan syndrome and that signaling pathway that we were talking about in the beginning, RAS, right, that small G uh, protein that we started off uh, last class uh, with, it stays tethered to the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane by a farnesylation uh, modification. We'll come back to that in a moment. What do prenylation events do? They covalently couple, couple by this thioether uh, linkage to that cysteine on the CAX box. The AAX actually gets cleaved away as part of the modification. So all you have is that now a C-terminal thiol covalently modified to some geranyl or farnesyl group. Because of this long aliphatic chain, that's thermodynamically favorable to be embedded into a membrane, which is where they end up. Exactly the same argument from meristillation, except it's occurring on the N terminus. So the meristoyl group is this long chain aliphatic, okay, and then forms an uh, amide linkage with that N terminal glycine after the methionine. So Similar theme, the methionine gets removed as a result of this enzyme-catalyzed reaction by an n meristoyl transferase, leaving a um, uh, meristoyl group going right in after the glycine and the rest of the translated polyprotein. Favored, again, into the plasma membrane, inner leaflet. So with those different post-translational modifications and targeting, we can go back to Noonan syndrome and we'll talk about one particular so I'll talk about one particular uh, mutation uh, inherited form of Noonan syndrome related to a category of proteins I want to talk about briefly, um, one example of which is called SHOC2. And so SHOC2 um, is peripherally involved in the RAS MAP kinase signaling cascade that I introduced from uh, before, um, but what it serves as is what's called a scaffold protein. So scaffold proteins, you can think of these are proteins that um, make a reaction brings together two proteins by binding each of them and allowing them to interact more frequently and more efficiently than they would if you didn't have the scaffold. I want to contrast that with the view of an adapter protein. Remember adapters, receptor, clathrin, you bring the two together. Adapters are viewed more as obligate partners to have those two other binding partners come together. In this setting, RAS and its binding partner, which I'll talk about in a moment, they will interact in the absence of SHOCK2. But SHOCK2, by being able to bind both of them, can bring the two of them together, closer proximity, more efficient interaction. So that's what scaffolds do. And what SHOCK2 
shock 2 does is scaffold RAS, the GTP loaded form of RAS, the active form of uh, RAS, with the first map kinase, 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 that upper tier, on the signaling cascade. The mutation in Noonan syndrome mutations that relates to, yes, question? The best way to do it, uh, try it in words, let me try it in cartoon form. Um, so as a result of the adapter protein, protein B here would be localized to wherever A is localized or vice versa. And you won't have that localization occur if it weren't for the adapter. In this cartoon here, if A performs some type of modification on B, A will perform a modification on B without the scaffold. But the scaffold, by binding A and binding B, and binding them in a competent way such that A can still interact with B, that's the scaffold. So it's like an enhancer of an interaction that can occur in the absence of the scaffold, whereas the adapter is obligate to enable that, that those two to be brought together. So shock 2 scaffolds RAS, GTP, and RAF. Ordinarily, it's a cytoplasmic protein. Nothing special to write home about for shock 2 except in these Noonan syndrome patients where there's a characteristic mutation that changes what's ordinarily a serine at the 2 position, the second amino acid, to a glycine. So if you change that serine 2 to a glycine, now you have methionine. Always need to start with methionine, then followed by a glycine. And what the paper that I had cited in the beginning of this, uh, this uh, talk uh, showed was that for individuals that have inherited this uh, mutation now have meristylated shock 2 hydrophobic on the N terminus, embedded in the leaflet, inner leaflet of the plasma membrane, now constitutively localized to the plasma membrane, where RAS is constitutively localized to the plasma membrane, where now by virtue of shock 2, RAF, the first um, MAP kinase, kinase, kinase in that cascade, ordinarily is a cytoplasmic protein, except now with membrane localized shock 2, is also membrane localized by virtue of its scaffolding function. So now you've brought active RAS together with RAF, that begets active RAF, and that begets activation of this pathway all the way through. And this is the um, chronic signaling via this. Um, growth and proliferation uh, pathway is what's associated with the disease that I talked about in the, in the beginning. So it's one of the clearest examples of mislocalization giving rise to a developmental signal. A couple of protein trafficking people, Professor Saucerman, I don't know if you guys had him in class yet, interested in PKA localization. There's nuclear and cytoplasmic localization of second messenger signaling, um, as well as David Castle in cell biology. Questions about <laughs> protein trafficking? Yes? Okay, so the hydrophobic modifications that we talked about before, and I'm saying inner leaflet or outer leaflet, how does that, uh, what de determines that? It's where the enzymes that catalyze either the prenylation or the meristylation are located. So they're in the cytoplasm. If it's a cytoplasmic modification, you're going to have a hydrophobic residue in the cytoplasm. The thermodynamics will put it, the only places it can go, I should, I should also qualify that a little bit. One of the places it can go is the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. It can also go to the outer leaflet of the Golgi apparatus or a, a trafficking vesicle, but it's going to go to some cytoplasm adjacent membrane inside the cell. 
GPI linkages, by contrast, that enzyme is only in the secretory vesicles and on the plasma membrane surface. So it's in the lumen of those trafficking vesicles. So when the modification occurs, the only place for it to be able to go is to the interior membrane of the vesicle, which is contiguous with the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane when that vesicle fuses. Anybody watch like Monty Python? It's like, and now for something completely different. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna talk about metabolism. There's a big huge arc on central dogma. Move proteins all over the side of the cells. And it, there's a pretty profound shift now for the next couple um, of lectures. And what we're gonna address here is that um, the question of how does the cell get all of the energy that it needs to provide all of these functions that we've just walked through. Right. Where do these nucleoside triphosphates come from? How are nutrients taken in and converted to energy sources that enable things such as replication, transcription, translation, localization, et cetera? And we've wrapped this set of lectures around a couple different things. We'll start with obesity, move to diets, and talk about alcohol uh, in a class or two. Everybody knows about obesity. I'm gonna go through these slides relatively quickly, because I think a lot of this stuff is familiar to, to most of you. Public health problem, the diseases associated with it, high blood pressure, blood clots to the brain, elevated levels of triglycerides, and um, uh, lipoproteins, circulating lipoproteins in the blood, hyperlipidemia, um, as well as some, some cancers. There's a formal definition of obesity. I'll show it here. Talk a little bit about the ideal weight, which is can be quantified uh, according to um, this number called the body mass index. So the body mass index relates to some of the clinicians came up to be able to stratify individuals. It's effectively a weight to surface area uh, ratio. You can see the calculations here, and there are different classes depending upon whether you're male or female um, and how those numbers. Um, uh, surface area to weight relate. The landmark study that put obesity as a public health issue to the fore was a study done in uh, Scotland, which did an interventional study on modest weight loss, and then monitored these individuals over an extended period of time, documenting large changes in long-term mortality, as well as uh, prolonged changes in things such as uh, blood pressure, talking about hypertension before. We've touched on diabetes in other contexts, so better control of blood glucose levels, as well as reduction in circulating lipids. We've heard of things like cholesterol, HDL, LDL. So obesity, I'm gonna circle back to the, the diets and talk about why now there's the, the common understanding that something like obesity is really a metabolic disorder and it's very difficult to get an, uh, an individual outside of that metabolic state because of all of the different compensatory adaptations that can occur in these metabolic pathways that I'll introduce to you that can prevent um, you know, uh, uh, loss of weight, improvement of BM BMI, and so on. We have a long arc with this lecture. We have this one and then another long one um, after this. I'm gonna give you an outline of what we're going to cover. We're gonna begin with the notion of metabolism from the setting of ATP production. We'll look at ATP a little bit more uh, carefully uh, and talk about how it's produced by different uh, mechanisms inside the cell. That will then set the stage for how fats are uh, metabolized in the body and then tie that into different diet paradigms. I'll tell my own interesting anecdote segue into alcohol, and then this is the best point to talk about free radical biology um, because it ties in directly with some of the metabolic processes that I'll be talking about. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the fundamental energy cur uh, currency of both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. All of the other nucleoside triphosphates can quickly be uh, generated by exchange reactions based off of ATP and 
that's remind on the structure. Nitrogenous base, ribose, sugar, three phos uh, uh, phosphates, alpha, beta, gamma, combined by these phosphodiester bonds. And it's the hydrolysis of this gamma phosphate here that um, is energetically favorable and can be leveraged to catalyze other reactions that ordinarily would not be energy energetically favorable. So the coupling of this hydrolysis with other steps in the body is the, uh, is the key motivation, if you will, to have a lot of ATP sitting around inside the cell to, cat, uh, to as, act as a power source for those reactions. And we have very high ATP concentrations inside our cells. The estimates are one to two millimolar of ATP. And so it's, we have never up to this point described it as a rate limiting reaction, reactant in a kinase reaction or things like that. Because if it were, the cell would be dead, not enough energy. Let's talk about an evolutionary objective. If we say that a good evolutionary objective is to synthesize ATP under varying environmental conditions, the two key, the, the one key variable for uh, environmental conditions and metabolism is whether or not you have oxygen, at least in the realm of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Archaea that live in the deep sea vents and things, they play by different rules. If there is no oxygen or there's a deficiency in oxygen, we're under a so-called anaerobic condition. Aerobics, all right, so anaerobic, no, um, no oxygen or not enough oxygen. Here, energetically, um, what one does is then take carbon substrates that are so-called fermentable and use those to generate ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate with byproducts of carbon dioxide and either lactate we're talking about us, or ethanol if we're talking about yeast. Conversely, if a cell is undergoing metabolism in the presence of oxygen, these are aerobic conditions, it's the, sim it's the similar energetic goal to, sy to synthesize ATP from these precursors, but now the substrates change. Now metabolism is looking for what are called oxidative, uh, oxidizable substrates. We'll talk about redox reactions in, I think, a slide or two. And the byproducts are different. Carbon dioxide again, but now water. Um, and the reason is that um, oxygen here becomes the ultimate electron acceptor for these redox uh, reaction, and that's what gives rise to its byproduct. Mostly, uh, cells in our body prefer to operate under aerobic. Uh, conditions. However, you can encounter anaerobic conditions in, in striated muscle. So skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle will become um, anaerobic during, during exercise. The main energy producers, striated muscle, sarcomeres, remember all that? All those actin cross bridge cycles and things like that use up a lot of ATP, okay, and they can put stress on the cell. To begin talking about metabolism, we need to revisit the chemistry of reduction oxidation reactions. To remind, oxidation reactions are loss, losses of electrons, whereas reduction reactions are gain, gains of electrons. When we see many of these metabolic pathways that are redox reactions, usually what's occurring is that one of the reactants is getting oxidized where another of the reactants is getting reduced, so the electrons are being transferred from one substrate to another substrate en route to the formation of product. The metabolic substrates from our acid, they needed to be oxidizable. When they get oxidized, that is a thermodynamically favorable interaction. The exergonic there refers to negative delta G, right? So um, will, ha uh, can will happen spontaneously, thermodynamically favorable. One example is shown here. So the oxidation of ethanol, its uh, product is acid aldehyde. You'll hear more about that uh, soon. As a result of that chemical modification, this releases two electrons along with two protons from the, from the reactant. So it's the loss of these uh, electrons, which is the oxidation. Because the hydrogen and the electron loss are often coupled in biological reactions, 
these oxidation reactions are often called dehydrogenation reactions. And by extension, the enzymes that catalyze those dehydrogenation reactions are called dehydrogenases. So dehydrogenases catalyze oxidation reactions. And we'll hear more about alcohol dehydrogenase in a lecture or two. As I mentioned, when a metabolic substrate is undergoing dehydrogenase and undergoing oxidation, those electrons need to go somewhere. So there need to be electron acceptors in a lot of these uh, reactions. I already said that under aerobic conditions, oxygen will become the, the terminal electron uh, acceptor to create water. But there are a number of other things that need to accept electrons along the way um, that are important precursors to um, oxidative phosphorylation where oxygen is involved. These intermediates along the way, along these different dehydrogenation uh, reactions, are called coenzymes. I want to make that. So what coenzymes are is you can think of them as an additional substrate in the enzyme-catalyzed reaction whose state, the redox state, will change from the reactants to the product side of the chemical reaction. The coenzyme itself does not get destroyed by the reaction. It, can, it just flips back and forth between redox states, depending upon which direction the reaction is going. So coenzymes are distinct from cofactors. Remember, cofactors will be these usually small ions and things that are absolutely required for an enzyme to perform catalysis. These coenzymes, confusingly enough, are more in the category of, sub, of substrates that help um, the substrate go in to become its product and, as a result, undergo a modification from the chemical reaction. And the first one that I'd like you to be aware of is a coenzyme called NAD, or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. NAD is the oxidized state of the coenzyme. When it is reduced, it becomes NADH. And you'll hear me starting from this point forward to start talking about reducing equivalence of these coenzymes. And what I mean by that is this NAD, this, uh, NAD coenzyme has picked up two electrons. And as you can think of those electrons almost as like an energy storage mechanism for the coen the, uh, of the coenzyme. That those electrons we will cash in metabolically in later stages of uh, metabolism when there's oxygen around. But it's important to know that the NADHs are energy equivalents right now, and we'll talk about the exact bookkeeping of that um, likely next time. So the, the formal reaction is NAD plus one proton plus two electrons yields NADH. Some of the cartoons that we grab these slides from will use this shorthand notation of neutral hydrogens. Um, is roughly the same. What I want to emphasize is, uh, first let's talk about the chemical structure here. There's some similarities with things like ATP. So you have a nitrogenous base, ribose sugar. There's a two phosphates. And then there's this nicotinamide group here up on the top. It's the nicotinamide group that undergoes the redox re reaction. Oxidized form on the left, reduced form on the right. And uh, if people have heard of niacin, niacinamide, the vitamin B, B3, the vitamins, that provides the nicotinamide group for the coenzymes. That's why you need that vitamin. Help with metabolism. To reiterate, it's the reduced form, the re reducing equivalent, which is in the higher energy state of the coenzyme that will pass those electrons to other downstream processes that you'll hear about soon. We're going to begin by talking about anaerobic metabolism. These are all of the steps that do not require oxygen. Two main components. The first one, which we're going to talk a lot about, is called the glycolysis. This is taking glucose, which is a carbohydrate monomer, breaking it down um, to form a little bit of ATP, uh, 
couple of reducing equivalents and an ADH, um, and doesn't require oxygen. We will talk about how you can pick glycolysis where you go to glucose on the top and then a byproduct on the bottom, which will metabolic intermediate, which I'll mention in a moment. You can do the whole process backwards, meaning starting with that product on the bottom and running all the way back up to glucose through a process called the gluconeogenesis. So gluco, glucose, new formation, genesis. And we'll touch on why the coupling of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis is important for things like recovery after anaerobic um, metabolism in a couple of slides. At the end of glycolysis, there's an additional step here. There's actually a halfway point or bifurcation point, if you, if you will, of metabolism that determine, is dictated on whether or not there's oxygen in the environment. So I'll mention very briefly what happens if there is oxygen, because there's a lot more details to talk about on that. But then if there isn't oxygen, then those byproducts undergo a process called fermentation. And so this is that final breakdown to either ethanol or lact lactate without any um, gains in oxidation. The re any reducing equivalents you get from glycolysis are used up through the fermentation reaction. It'd be a little bit hard to introduce glycolysis without diving into all of the intermediates, the enzymes. It's really complicated. If you take a full-fledged biochemistry class um, you know, on, on, on grounds, I'll make you memorize all of these. I'm sure you can do it. Um, I'm not going to emphasize that. We'll, instead, what we're going to try to do is deconstruct glycolysis into a couple of key regulatory steps along the way, emphasize more the irreversible modifications that occur to glucose in the um, rate limiting steps and feedback control mechanism. Um, hopefully, those things have a better chance of sticking with you. So let's talk a little bit about the molecules in greater detail. This is glucose, the input to glycolysis, six carbon sugar. The output of glycolysis are two molecules of um, a molecule called pyruvate. Its chemical structure is shown here. One, two, three carbons. So you go from six carbons to two by three through the, the steps of glycolysis. And the three major steps that we'll talk about We've named them the preparation and cleavage step, which is to get that six carbon chain ready to get cut into two sets of three. There's an oxidation, a dehydrogenation reaction along the way in between. And then there's the final formation of pyruvate at the end, which is where um, we'll gain the, the, the few ATPs that we can get out of glycolysis. Other thing I have a note here to remind me about for those that haven't taken organic chemistry, we can show six carbon glucose in its, sorry, in its closed form here on the left-hand side, or we can show it in its open chain form where this is uh, reacted out and then we're taking basically this oxygen here and then running these around to the one, one, two, three, four, five, one on the top carbon position clockwise, one, two, three, four, five, six, around the carbon chain. They're tautomers of one another. You can run them back and forth based on some simple chemical modifications. It's just easier bookkeeping to run them out in that open chain, open chain form. But just be aware that they're also in the closed chain form in reality. Preparation and cleavage. Here's the input and output reactions for this first step. Couple take-homes of the, these first couple steps. First is that it is it requires ATP hydrolysis. So you're putting energy into the system to be able to get through this preparation and cleavage <coughs> step. We will take two glu uh, glucose molecule, two ATPs that get hydrolyzed to form two intermediates called uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The specific steps here, that where the ATPs are involved, is in phosphorylating the glucose. There's a kinase here, hexakinase, that will add a phosphate uh, here. 
You have an isomerization reaction up here, a rearrangement of these oxygens and double bonds here. Another phosphorylation by an enzyme called phosphofructokinase to phosphorylate the other end. Now you start having a symmetry, the beginning of a symmetry in this open chain form in the intermediate here. That gets cleaved by an enzyme called aldolase, and then there's an isomerization reaction that moves this, rea this product to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So you can think of this preparation and cleavage steps as a couple of different phosphorylations, some rearrange rearrangements, and then a splitting, more rearrangements, and then two identical molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And as I already said, this is energy loss at this point. With glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, there are additional modifications, specifically a dehydrogenation reaction that's going to involve the NAD coenzyme and the generation of reducing equivalents. It's here I need to remind, even though we'll show it in cartoon form for one glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, each of these steps is happening two times if you're doing the accounting on the glucose molecule. Because remember, we cut it in half, and so this is happening twice. So we have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. There's a glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase that will perform this chemical modification and generate one reducing equivalent of NADH for each glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So that times two. And then the next step here this is with the help of another, another kinase, is going to be the first ATP generating step of glycolysis. And this is called a substrate level phosphorylation because what occurs here is that it's the direct transfer of a phosphate from the metabolic substrate. This phosphate here that I have highlighted in red is going to move off of this metabolic intermediate and onto the ADP to synthesize ATP. There are other means of generating ATP in aerobic me metabolism that don't involve any of these substrate level phosphorylation uh, events. And that's why we, we have this distinction between the two. The oxidation and ATP generation is going to get an NADH, one ATP, and both of those times two for each of the glyceraldehyde three phosphates that were cleaved in the earlier preparation step. All of the ATP that's been generated up to this point has simply offset the two ATPs that we consumed in the first preparation step. So that doesn't give us anything um, up to this point except for the two reducing equivalents of NADH. And the output here is an intermediate called 3-phosphoglycerate. In the final step, there's a couple of other kinase and uh, enolase catalyzed uh, reactions to achieve another round of substrate level phosphorylation and the generation of a pyruvate. This went a, uh, a, a different route on a different slide. We're going to start on the right hand side here with 3 phosphoglycerate. There's a, a shuffling of where this phosphate is on the uh, intermediate. You have this enol reaction to generate this intermediate called phosphoenol pyruvate. It's a little bit more. We'll talk about that uh, in a moment. And then it's here with this kinase called pyruvate kinase, where you have the last uh, substrate level phosphorylation, the phosphate here, getting transferred onto an ADP to yield ATP, and then this becoming pyruvate. All of this happening twice also. So from top to bottom, you can take each one of these inputs and outputs and you wire the pathway together like this. Glucose is going to take two oxidized NADs. This is using that neutral hydrogen, two ADPs and inorganic phosphates to yield two pyruvates, two reducing equivalents of NADH, some additional uh, products, and then the two ATP molecule. Four are synthesized along the way, but two are consumed, so the net output is the generation of two. 
And I want to emphasize this happens in prokaryotes, eukaryotes, everywhere. Okay, and essential for life. This is how you generate ATP. And that output of uh, pyruvate now is where you have a couple different decision points for the cell to go metabolically. These can differ by organism, and they, as I already mentioned, differ based upon the environment of the cell, whether or not there's oxygen. If there is oxygen, very briefly, what will occur is that this pyruvate will take this path up here, will get further oxidized, release a carbon dioxide, and then go and form, I get coupled to another coenzyme, which I'll speak more about next class, called coenzyme A, to yield the input for another cycle that we're going to talk about related to aerobic respiration. So more to come on that. I want to say a little bit more about what happens if fermentation is occurring, if there's not uh, O2 around in these two different paths. If we're talking about yeast, and if yeast are grown under oxygen deficient conditions, this is how we have alcoholic fermentation. So starting with pyruvate, they have a, an enzyme called pyru <coughs> pyruvate decarboxylase, which we don't have. All right, so this is why we can't ferment Al alcoholically. All right. It releases a CO2. That CO2 is the bubbles in your champagne or in your beer. And then this will, conti will, will continue to go along fermentation. Here is that reducing equivalent that gets used. OK, so now acetaldehyde gets reduced into ethanol. And that's alcoholic fermentation. And to reemphasize, the reason why we can't do it is for lack of this enzyme. We have this enzyme, the alcohol dehydrogenase, that converts acetaldehyde to ethanol but we don't have the pyruvate decarboxylase that allows us to get to acid aldehyde. What we have instead is the fermentation into lactate. Chemical structure shown here. There's another dehydrogenase called lactate dehydrogenase that takes the pyruvate to make lactate. And then it's here where the reducing equivalent of NADH is used up as the final product. So those two, and again, that all of those happen times two because of the two pyruvates that were generated by glycolysis. So those get used up if you undergo uh, fermentation. All you have are the two ATPs, but it can hold itself through under anaerobic conditions until they improve. And the last thing for me to, uh, to touch on is what happens to the lactate. Because there's no like additional branch point after that. Okay, so lactate can build up uh, as lactic acid, change the pH of cells. It can do damage if it builds up too much. This is a waste product that cells need to be able to handle. And in fact, this is one of the main um, evolutionary advantages or driving forces, if you will, for that gluconeogenesis process that I talked about as the antonym for glycolysis. Let's say that we've gone out for a run or an exercise and um, built up a whole bunch of lactate anaerobic metabolism in the skeletal muscle. How is that lactate handled? Well, the lactate can diffuse outside of cells. There are transporters that will uh, enable it to be excreted. It goes through the bloodstream. And the main place for gluconeogenesis, to take lactate and run it back up to glucose, is in the liver. And so what occurs in the liver is that lactate will take up, be taken up You'll, um, in a redox neutral manner, convert this back to pyruvate, these same steps that we're talking about before and then run it all the way back upwards to, to glucose. This is a net energy loss. There's only putting in ATP to be able to get back to glucose. But the reason for doing so is that you're preventing the lactate buildup inside of the cells. And so this um, cycle of anaerobic glycolysis in the skeletal muscle and gluconeogenesis in the liver together is called the Cori cycle because that glucose can also get excreted by the liver, go into the bloodstream, and used by target, target tissues. I'm going to stop there. And then I think I have about five slides worth that I'll go through in a post-lecture and post by this evening. <laughs>
Uh, and to remind, that won't be on the quiz, uh, but it is fair game for the very last quiz and on the last exam.